What up, everybody, and welcome. In this episode, we're talking battery relocation and how to choose the right battery for you. Now, there's tons of videos on this topic, so I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. However, a lot of these videos are just handheld, shaky footage of someone dragging the camera around while they move the battery from the under the hood to the back of the trunk. This is going to be way more than that, and I'm going to try to give you a good understanding of the why and how to properly relocate your battery and choosing the right one for you. Now, I'm gonna try to keep this video short, but sometimes I like to talk too much. For those new to the channel, my name is Alex, AKA the Rotary Knight, that's Rotary underscore Knight, like Knight in shining armor. Now you can find me on Instagram with that hashtag, no, with that tag, is that what they call it? I'm getting old. Anyways, you can find me on Instagram if you ever have questions in the future, or uh, just hit me up in the comments down below. So some pro tips to consider when relocating your battery. Now, first and foremost, with anything I do in life, I always ask myself, why? 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 Why do you want to relocate your battery? Is it just because that's the hype thing to do? Do you want to be the next Toge monster? Are you a drag racer and need more weight over the rear wheels? Would you just LS swap your old car and you have no room in the engine bay? Jesus Christ. You're an audiophile who needs like 200 pounds of batteries with nowhere to put them. Or do you need 1.21 gigawatts to go back in the future? 1.21 gigawatts! Or is it giga? 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 Basically, starting off with the why helps us understand our design constraints. My driving style is going to be more of the weekend, going out into the Santa Cruz mountains, <laughs> or finding a local track to do a track day. That's my style of driving. So I want something with some proper weight balance. However, if you're doing a dedicated track car, your race sanctioning body is going to have some strict rules about how to actually relocate your battery. They're going to want you to have a battery box, some ventilation, and a safety kill switch somewhere in the car. So to help you out, I got a couple of rules from the popular sanctioning bodies, and I put them in the comments down, not in the comments, I put them in the description down below. Now back to the why for relocating the battery. As I mentioned, I want to improve the weight balance of my car. And there's an interesting Super Street article back from 2008. The article was written by Mike Kojima. Y'all should know who Mike Kojima is of Moto IQ. If you don't, look him up. He's got tons of uh, amazing information on, on just handling cars, dialing in your suspension, you name it. Look him up. Now in this article, they took an 886 Corolla, they put it on corner scales, and they measured the weight distribution as they moved the OEM battery around. Now they started with it in the OEM position, which I believe is in the front left of the engine bay behind the headlight. It's the same as the FC. And then they moved around the popular spots in the trunk and the right, or yeah, right and left. And then behind the front seats, behind the driver and behind the passenger. And they tried to figure out where's the optimum weight balance uh, to have the battery. Now, if you just look at front and rear ratio, it looks like having it in the right rear of the trunk is the best location. But But there's this other thing called the polar moment of inertia you might want to keep in handy. This, blah, blah, blah. try to say polar moment of inertia five times fast. There's this other thing called the polar moment of inertia. Now, what that refers to is the way a car reacts to the twist or changes in the um, direction. Let's find a clever way to describe this. What do I have in the garage? Okay. This isn't the best example, but I have this little bottle here, right? When we're talking about resisting this torsion, uh, basically when I do this, right, the weight is on the ends and it's sloshing back and forth. You can feel it when I change direction, it doesn't like it. However, when you have the weight on the center like this and I twist it, it's super easy and there's nothing sloshing around. So the point of the polar moment is basically the more weight you have towards the center, the easier it'll be to rotate. It won't resist that twisting motion so much. So this is why on cars like ours, they have a low polar moment of inertia, which means the weight is closer to the center axis of the car, which means it's easier to rotate. This can also be a double-edged sword because sometimes it can be really snappy and difficult to maintain uh, control over when things get a little hairy. Now, just to give you another example, let's look at the S2000 compared to the FC. 
I like to use this because the S2000 has a really low polar moment of inertia, uh, even better than the FC. Now, in, when you look at the engine bays of the two, they're very similar because the engines are pushed as far back to the firewall as possible. They're behind the front axle, so they're, they're inside uh, that front axle line. But if we look at the fuel tanks of the two, the FC is way in the back. It's hanging over the rear axle. But the S2000 has a much smaller fuel tank and is hanging inside the rear axle right behind the driver. Getting a phone call. Where was I? Oh yeah, the S2000 fuel tank. Now that fuel tank is like right behind the driver's seat and it's inside the rear axle. And I wanna say the capacity is super small. The FC is like 16 gallons. The S2000 is S2000 fuel capacity. S2000 has a 13.2 fuel tank capacity. I don't know if you heard that, but 13.2 gallons. So it's three gallons less than the FC. The S2000 is like 20 years newer than the FC was. You can see where their minds were. They wanted to improve that polar moment and make it lower. So they moved the weight inside. I'm getting really deep into this more than you guys probably care. So let's move on. So the whole point is how can you make improve that? Well, if you have the battery in the trunk, uh, you're actually making the polar moment higher, making it dip more difficult to transfer that weight. Now, a 30 pound battery may not have that big an effect, but they're still an effect overall. So a way to improve it, move the battery behind the front passenger seat. And that is actually the same option that I chose for me. Now, everybody does that more or less, but I wanted to give you the reasoning of why they actually do that. Now we get the point of why we chose to put the battery behind the front passenger seat. Now, how do you know to choose the right battery? There's actually many different types of batteries out there you can choose from. Now, what you're probably typically used to is a wet cell battery. That's what most OEM batteries are. Now they're wet because there's a liquid electrolyte solution inside the battery. Typically we refer to, refer to it as battery acid when you see it leaking out of the battery case. I do not recommend putting a wet cell battery inside your car. Um, mostly for the reasons that inside that thing is very toxic, highly corrosive, it'll rust and eat through your paint if that thing ever leaks and they uh, can also leak uh, gases and they need to have proper ventilation if you're gonna move it inside the car. If you don't have proper ventilation and sparks are anywhere nearby and that thing is have, has gas exposed, it will explode. You could, if you're balling, get a lithium ion battery. Now these things are freaking crazy expensive. However, they're super lightweight, fully sealed, and you can mount them just about anywhere in any position. Uh, the only problem is they're like 10 times as much as a typical battery. So for most weekenders like myself, that's way out of line and over our budget. Instead, we're gonna go with the good old trusty dry cell battery uh, that we refer to as an AGM or gel cell. AGM refers to absorbent glass mat and the gel cell is just a gel. And the difference is the electrolyte solution is not wet, it's absorbed in either the gel or the AGM. And the thing that's nice about those is these are typically fully sealed, which means they don't have gases that require ventilation if you are gonna mount it inside. And you can mount them almost in any direction, except upside down. I think most of the time they don't recommend mounting it upside down. So get yourself a AGM or gel cell uh, battery. Now we know what type of battery to get. How do you know which one is the right for you? Because there's a bunch out there. Now I used to run this Red Top Optima battery right here, but this thing finally died after about eight years and it's so heavy, I decided let me go with a different option. Now to make my decision easier, what I did is I benchmarked the OEM specs. So here's a chart of uh, the, a breakdown of what I went through to decide the best one for me. What we're gonna do is we're gonna compare the cranking amps, the cold cranking amps, and the amp hours. Just a disclaimer, I'm not gonna explain all the differences between those. You can just Google it real quick or find it on Wikipedia. Basically the cranking amps refer to how much power you have to crank the motor over, and the amp hours are sort of like a power reserve that you have left in the battery. Anyways, the OEM battery is about 700 cranking amps and about 550 or so cold cranking amps. The amp hours are about 60. Now let's compare that to my trusty Red Top Optima battery here. The Red Top has cranking amps of about 900 and the cold cranking amps is 720 and the amp hours are about 44. Now the reason I had the Red Top is because I used to daily drive the RX-7. And so having that extra bit of power was nice. It is heavy. It's actually a little bit heavier than the OEM one. This brings me to the battery I bought now, which is the Braille battery. Now this Braille battery has cranking amps of 640, the cold cranking amps about 475, 
and the amp hours are 23. But there's a little disclaimer here too with this battery. They like to advertise the pulse cranking amps. And there's about 1200 pulse cranking amps. What does that mean? Basically for about like three seconds, you have a lot of power and they don't have as much power reserve. So if you have a car with a lot of electronics, maybe I would look the other way. And if you daily drive your car, I would not recommend these little Braille batteries. Go with an Optima. But the Braille battery weighs only 17 pounds. It's puny in comparison to that. And one last thing to consider about the weights. Now, imagine you're going to mount a 40 pound battery somewhere inside the car. This thing is like a projectile. Now we can do our best to actually mount these things properly. But let's say you get in a big accident. I don't want to risk this bowling ball thing of a battery flying at me or flying at my passenger in case of an emergency. So the lighter, the better. Now, what do you need to install it? So you're going to have to forgive me. I'm not going to go into like a really deep DIY on how to do this. I'm just going to give you an overview of the things you need. And then the things that I actually, another phone call. I lost where I was at. So yeah, I'm not going to go super deep DIY on this and give you all the step by step. But uh, instead, I'm just going to give you a quick overview and show you some pictures of what I did on my car. Now, the things you'll need, obviously, you're going to need a long power cable. I got mine. It's a 25 foot zero gauge power cable. I recommend a jump post or a jump terminal that you can mount in the engine bay. This way, say you need to jump your car. You don't want to run like the live cables into the car itself. You can still like jump it from under the engine bay. Super handy and convenient. You're going to need some uh, lugs for the connection so you can actually uh, solder on or crimp the connections at the end of the cable and mount it where you need to. And then we need at least 150 amp circuit breaker. Now I want to talk about the circuit breaker and this is a note for you FC people out there. Uh, if you don't own an FC, just uh, ignore this next 30 seconds. So FC 3S Pro has a write up online on how to relocate your battery. The only thing is they have a redundancy in that system and where they use two circuit breakers, one in the engine bay and one behind the passenger seat. The only problem I have with that is the circuit breaker in the engine bay. Now, most circuit breakers that I found online have a max operating temperature of like 180 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll have to double check, but it's something around there off the top of my head. It is pretty easy to get to that temperature under the hood, especially uh, like places I've been racing in the desert in the middle of the summer. It's not hard breaking 180 degrees under there, especially with a rotary. So there are ways you can get around that, but it's like an unnecessary redundancy. So I don't recommend doing it. And it's better to have the circuit breaker closer to the battery anyways. And just as living proof, I mean, my setup has, was working for 13 years. So it's fine. On to my setup. Now under the hood, you'll see my jump post and I recycled an old bracket over here from the fuel pump resistor relay. I actually made a video about how to uh, rewire your fuel pump and delete this whole relay, but the bracket came in handy. There was a little bit of bending involved to the brake lines just to get it slightly out of the way. And then um, making sure I cover up any exposed metal when I'm routing the power cable into the inside of the car. Uh, you can see the ground I had for the engine bay uh, here. And then I'm running my power cable inside. And it's just going through the harness grommet that's for the wiring harness to the engine bay. And when we're running and following it down from the harness grommet inside the car, it's just routing underneath the interior uh, along the door seal to those rear storage bins. Now, when we get to mounting the battery where the storage bin area is, I actually recycled over the stock uh, battery tray uh, from the engine bay. And it took a little modifications to get it to sit uh, flat and level, but you can actually pull it off with the FC stock tray. The only thing you wanna make sure here is uh, when you're mounting this thing, make sure you have some washers and some nice chunky fender washers for the outside. The reason being is say you do get an accident or something happens, if you have some larger surface area, those fender washers will actually help to hold it in place so it doesn't fly out. And then for the ground, I would take the advice of the Haltech guys in their battery relocation video. Make sure you get yourself a nice chunky piece of metal. Uh, for the FC owners, we got plenty of chunky metal around. Just don't use a thin piece of sheet metal. That's all. And so yeah, this was my attempt to go through this at least around 10 minutes or less. I don't know what the time is. Uh, I'm going to stitch this all together. There may be some jump cuts. I'm sorry. Uh, but I hope you found this information useful and helpful. Overall, let me know what you think of the relocation of the new Braille battery um, mounting it. Oh, I almost forgot to mention uh, when it came to making that actual battery tied out, I just made my own with some right angle brackets uh, I had laying around. 
yeah, I hope you found this information helpful. Uh, as always, I'll have uh, links to everything in the description down below. I have made an Amazon affiliate link partnership thing. So, you know, whatever you get down there, if you do buy it, uh, it helps me out to make more of these videos and feeds back to you guys. So anything is appreciated. Um, and I'll have my, a link to my Instagram. So if you want to hit me up on it, send me a DM. If you need some help on your project, let me know. So basically ask yourself why, why before you start doing these whole modifications and how you're going to use it, what's your use case. And then make sure you're doing the modifications that are right for you. Don't just do them because that's a hype beast thing to do. And you want to be the next yada yada. No, no, do it. What's right for you. Educate yourself. Make sure it's the right move. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Reach out down below and uh, I'll see you all in the next one. Adios.